It's my pleasure to introduce the moderator of our second panel this morning. Uh, he's a very distinguished fellow, Frank Hoffman, to my right. I've known Frank for a number of years now, and, and he is a, a sparkling intellect. And uh, he's a retired Marine Corps infantry officer. He's an ROA member. He's a graduate of the Wharton School uh, and numerous other distinguished universities. Uh, as I say, a prolific author. He served on two very important commissions in, 19, in the 1990s on the roles and missions of the armed services, and later with the Hart Rudman Commission as the, on the Commission on National Security. Uh, he's also written for uh, the Officer Magazine in our National Security Report. And so it's a great uh, privilege to introduce Frank for our second panel. Uh, uh, just a great friend of ROA and, and uh, also, I, I, hate, I forgot to mention, a fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute and also a fellow at the Center for Emerging Threats and Opportunities. Frank? Thank you very much. Can uh, everybody see and hear me from here? I'm going to try to do this seated. Uh, we have a very distinguished panel for you today on a very interesting topic that is uh, somewhat of a little bit of an outlier. I don't think we normally consider this particular topic as one within the civil military relations uh, forum. We think about society and the military. We think about decision making between statesmen and uh, generals, but we don't usually bring it down to a, to a lower level. We're all familiar with Sam Huntington's book, The Clash of Civilizations. Well, there's also a little bit of a clash of civilization that goes on anytime one puts together uh, different organizational cultures. Uh, and in, in the civil military relations realm, uh, we do a little bit of that in, in the clash of civilizations between uh, civilian strategy makers and policy makers and uh, the military when it, when it comes together here in Washington. Well, the same clash or mismatch of culture sometimes occurs in the operational and tactical realms as well. And the history of the CPA in Baghdad is, is a little bit a part of that. And some of the teams and the PRTs we're fielding in, the, in, the, uh, in Afghanistan today also represent a little bit of clash of civilization because the, these are organizations that are hybrid which actually merge military and civilian personnel. Uh, we had an interesting comment in the previous panel about you know when the military is ready to state to take commands you know from the State Department or if somebody from USAID or another civilian will know that the clash of civilization has kind of gone away. So that was uh, my intent in putting together this particular panel and designing this and incorporating it into the uh, into the program for today. And it, and I, we did so at the recommendation of Tom Ricks. So I'll give Tom a little bit of credit uh, for that. Uh, we have three uh, I'll call them experts. Uh, in, in this uh, domain uh, on this panel. To my immediate right, Bernie Caro, who is currently a senior fellow at the Center for uh, National Security and Technology Policy, which is over at uh, NDU, the National Defense University. So he's kind of living in the military realm today. But in his prior history, he's been a Deputy Assistant Secretary for Commerce, and he's worked uh, in the civilian realm. So uh, he, he can bridge both worlds um, and has that experience level. Uh, to his right, Heather Coyne. Uh, I've known Heather for some time when she worked over in the Office of Management and Budget uh, in the White House and worked on national security uh, issues, attendant to Homeland Security when I was working in that realm. Uh, she also has a background as a captain of the United States Army. She spent some time in Baghdad and stayed in Baghdad and transitioned over from military service into civilian service working uh, over there and staying over uh, in the fight for a period of time, which I give her great credit for. Uh, she is now working with the United States Institute for Peace, where she continues to work on cutting edge areas of civil and military interaction uh, in the field. And to her right, Dr. Nadia Shallow, another old friend of FPRI and uh, I think many people here in town. Uh, Nadia holds a PhD from SICE, undergraduate degree from Cornell University. She's worked uh, as a presidential management intern in OSD and as a civil servant in OSD policy, uh, where I think I ran into her again a few, a few times. Uh, she's now with the Smith Richardson Foundation where she works as a program officer and is fairly well known here in town. Uh, she's also uh, been doing some cutting edge research in uh, designing institutions and organizations for civil military interaction uh, in complex contingencies which I think uh, makes her particularly relevant for this particular panel. She's also wrote a, a very prominent article in Parameters magazine of the Army War College on uh, the Army and governance and pointing out to the Army its long-standing history and its relevant core competencies, at least in the past, in uh, post-conflict governance, which I think is also relevant to the question today. Dr. Shadlow is also a member of uh, the Secretary of Defense's Defense Policy Board since 2006. Uh, without further ado, then, we're going to turn to the, to the questions of the interagency, the process, and the clash of cultures, and our paper will be delivered by Bernie Caro. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. Um, as Frank said, uh, I think this topic is maybe a little bit more esoteric in the context of the broader theme of today's uh, session. Uh, but nonetheless, I think it is topical because of the Iraq War and Afghanistan, and I think there's been a, a lot of attention on the issue of command and control issues in the actual operational context and the relationship between state and DOD, uh, as well as with other agencies. So what I want to do today is step back a little bit and just look at um, a sort of a brief history of this uh, since the end of the Cold War, because I think there's a context here that we sometimes miss uh, in this uh, relationship between DOD and the civilian, agency, civilian agencies, particularly with the State Department, but not exclusively with the State Department. One thing I would start with is to point out that I think in the, in the Cold War years, things were a little bit easier. I think there was a gen generally a foreign policy consensus, and there was a consensus on the use of force. You had containment and all of that, and uh, things went a little bit more smoothly. Uh, even with uh, Vietnam, despite all the contention and the controversy over Vietnam, by and large, I think DOD and the State Department got along better. There was more of a sense of mission. Um, that started to change a little bit when the post, when the Cold War ended. There was this, this sense of what do we do now? What's, what's our foreign policy all about? What is the appropriate use of force after the Berlin Wall came down? And then you had a series of foreign operations throughout the 90s, starting with Kuwait, the liberation of Kuwait in 1991. Then uh, President Bush, 41, uh, decided to launch an operation in Somalia. Clinton then continued with uh, Haiti, Rwanda, uh, Bosnia, and Kosovo. But I think the interesting thing about this history in the 1990s is the burgeoning tension is maybe a strong word, but the, the um, disagreements that started to arise between DOD and the State Department. And one of the things I like to point out is in the 1990s, a lot of these operations, uh, the military didn't quite see the use of force as an appropriate thing uh, at the time. Even in Kuwait, some folks in the military thought that uh, Kuwait did not rise to the level of the Weinberger Powell Doctrine. You know, was this really a national security emergency? And then Somalia, with uh, the, the purely humanitarian assistance, that raised a lot of eyebrows as well. Uh, although Somalia, I think, might have gone by as just a blip until the Black Hawk Down incident, and then I think that brought into sharp relief a lot of the tensions and a lot of the issues that the military was concerned about, such as chain of command, the relationship between the U.S. military and international organizations such as the United Nations. Uh, in the Clinton years, uh, these operations started to uh, expand and you, you had Haiti and Rwanda and Bosnia and Kosovo. I think the interesting thing about these operations is that many of them were actually pushed by the State Department. This is something the uh, State Department considered to be to be part of, of, of its mission and, and you know Madeleine Albright at one point famously said I think to Colin Powell well you know if, if you can't use force what's the point of having it? So there was the State Department actually encouraging and pushing the White House and pushing DOD in these areas. And it became, I think, such an issue that when um, President George uh, W. Bush ran uh, his election campaign in 2000, this was so controversial with the military and I think with a lot of members of the public that he was able to run partly on this platform of anti-nation building, you know, this, this whole failed state nation building. Uh, stopping genocide, uh, ethnic cleansing, the, all of those terms sort of came of age during the 1990s um, under the Clinton years. And, and Clinton is, it, it, they're largely associated with Clinton, even though interestingly enough it was Bush's father who actually started it in Somalia um, in, in uh, 1992. Then um, George W. Bush is elected and, and uh, when 9-11 comes along, there is a consensus. You know, once again, the consensus comes back. Those, those will, what I call the wilderness years between the end of the Cold War and 9-11 um, uh, ended. And all of a sudden, there was a mission. There was a new mission. Containment was replaced by the global war on terror. There was more of a, um, a sense of agreement among all of the agencies about when the use of force was appropriate. 
And I think, interestingly enough, Afghanistan was a case in point. There, there was a relatively, the government spoke, uh, spoke with a relatively unified voice on that issue. State and DOD uh, went forward together. Um, in fact, the Bush administration even appointed uh, Ambassador James Dobbins, who was largely asso associated with the peacekeeping and peace enforcement operations of the 1990s, to head up the U.S. government's uh, um, body that was dealing with the Afghanistan government, the, the formation of the new Afghanistan government. So all of that, you know, things seemingly would have gone along and there would have been better tensions until Iraq happened. But the interesting thing about this, I think, is in the 1990s, the State Department was ascendant. The State Department sort of held sway over when uh, it was appropriate to use force and when not. Um, and that sort of changed with Iraq when DOD uh, was ascended, or at least the civilian leadership of DOD held sway. Uh, so I think there is this sense, and I'm not sure that my colleagues at, at State would agree with me, but there is this uh, sense of longing in the State Department for the, the, uh, you know, the, the, the days when they had more influence over the use of force. Uh, and I think that's part of the reason that, that Iraq created so much tension. In addition, lots of folks talk about this, uh, for want of a better term, I think it's come to be known as this power imbalance between DOD and state. Um, and many of you are familiar with the facts here. The, the um, resources and authorities and missions of DOD have continued to grow and increase, and state's resources have either stayed stagnant uh, or actually uh, decreased. We've had agencies disappear, like the United States Information Agency, um, and and then uh, at DOD, the Office of Policy keeps growing and, and, and getting bigger. DOD's budget has doubled over the last decade. States have stayed stagnant. Uh, everybody knows the history of Luger Biden. It's been sort of languishing over the last uh, couple of years in Congress, not passed yet. States' authorization bill doesn't pass from year to year. Of course, DOD's passes every single year. Uh, some folks think that Goldwater Nichols in the 1980s actually uh, cre uh, empowered the combatant commanders uh, somewhat at the expense of ambassadors. And then there's the uh, Flexible Transfer Authority, uh, 1207, whereby DOD was able to transfer funds to state, but that uh, authority lapsed. Uh, there's a similar imbalance between DOD and AID. Uh, according to one statistic I read, uh, DOD's share of what the OECD calls official development assistance actually grew from about 6% to about 22% between 2002 and 2005, which is quite startling. Uh, of course, most of that has to do with uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, but nonetheless, that is a startling statistic. Uh, in Iraq, remember, initially in Iraq, there was that $2 billion uh, congressional appropriation, supplemental appropriation in April of 2003, which went to AID. But then the big daddy, the big, uh, the big supplemental appropriation in November of that year, the 18.6 billion, the lion's share of that money went to DOD, and only a much smaller share went to AID and Justice and Treasury and a couple of other agencies. But the lion's share of that money went to DOD. And then in addition, you've got the SERP funds or DACA funds that, that the uh, um, uh, soldiers and Marines on the ground are, are able to take advantage of. And the PRTs, while they're touted as being interagency uh, groups, uh, civil military groups, and they're supposed to be models of civil military cooperation, in fact, they are overwhelmingly manned by the military. Uh, and it's true, there's, you know, there's a couple of ag folks on them and maybe one or two AID people, but overwhelmingly, they're overwhelmingly manned by the military. Uh, the other thing I'd point out about AID um, is that, in a sense, AID has been a dying agency for many years. Uh, back in the 70s, there were about 12,000 full-time employees at AID. They're down to about 2,000, which makes the overseas missions of AID largely contract managers. You don't have that same kind of specialization as you had back in the Cords era of Vietnam in the 60s and, and uh, 70s. In addition, um, when the Bush administration first came on, um, it kind of looked askance at traditional development. They just didn't like it. They, they thought it wasn't working. It was wasting money. Uh, there were corrupt governments uh, uh, using up the money. So instead, they created the Millennium Challenge Corporation, 
um, which worked on a different set of criteria and, and, and it had its own charter whereby countries vying for assistance had to meet certain democracy goals and certain market liberalization goals and anti-corruption goals and whatnot. But the point is M the Millennium Challenge Corporation drained attention away and it drained resources away from AID. So AID continued to shrink. So uh, what's behind the imbalance? Um, lots of folks look at it. On the bottom there I have, it's not really the militarization of, militarization of foreign policy. I think there are lots of folks in the foreign policy community who interpret it that way. Uh, I would disagree with that. I don't know that it's militarization in the sense that, that the White House or, or as, as, a, as a nation, we're more likely to go into war. After all, in the 1990s, I think the state, it was actually the State Department that was pushing the use of force more often than DOD. Uh, so I don't, I don't buy into that theory, although there, that is a, that's a view that is held by many people. Uh, it's not so much that this is a DOD power grab, but what it is is that the other agencies have not been able to step up to the plate. They simply have not transformed themselves the way DOD has, and partly of necessity. They've had to. The services have had to, have had to do this to respond to the situation on the ground in Iraq and Afghanistan. The military is not happy about this. They certainly want partners. We've seen that in the QDR, the Quadrennial Defense Review. There was a lot of emphasis on building partner capacity, not only with international allies, but also within the interagency. Uh, Directive 3000 came out all about military support to um, stability operations, and the document is all about finding partners, NGOs, private sector, interagency, um, and, and, and uh, allies and whatnot. And you've seen some movement. The State Department created the uh, Coordinator for Reconstruction and Stabilization. Uh, AID has tried to sort of reinvent itself. It's got an Office of Military Affairs. It's got a new Office of Infrastructure and, and Engineering. Um, it has focused more on, on uh, it's got a failed state strategy. Uh, it's trying to put development advisors and all of the COCOM. So you've seen this movement. AID is trying to sort of make itself relevant again by, by um, latching on to uh, the security and, and, um, and uh, reconstruction uh, issue. One of the points that I would make about this uh, power imbalance is that it has had the effect of diverting the focus of an issue that we really have not come to grips with. And I'm going to talk more about that later. That has to do with what is post-war stabilization, just exactly how do we stabilize. Uh, what most of the wrangling and debate, both um, internal, I would say, and external debate, has been about who should be in control. A lot of this has been about <coughs> command and control issues, not just on the ground, not just who's in charge on the ground, but who really controls foreign policy. Who controls the decision to use force? And with that came, you know, this chain of command thing. You know, should DOD report it, be reporting to state or should state be reporting to DOD? What's the relationship between the military and the civilians? Uh, all important questions, of course. Um, but it bypassed the larger issue of just what should we be doing on the ground? Just how do we stabilize? Um, so the hierarchy, logically, one would think is you'd sort of come up with, okay, what's the policy? How do we do this? You know, what's, what's the doctrine on stabilization? And then you might talk about agency capabilities, who can do what, what resources do they have, what kind of supplemental do you need? And then finally, you would deal with command and control issues um, and the interagency interaction on the ground. Uh, but of course, in Iraq, what happened was almost exactly the opposite. You know, first you got the command and control issues, uh, you had you know, CPA set up, um, you had sort of the dual chain of command uh, between the military and the civilian sides. Then you had um, some focus on, on the agency capabilities, trying to bring all of the agencies in, just get as many as you can, get labor, get commerce, justice, treasury, uh, whoever you can, get them here on the ground. Uh, we'll see if we can find resources, we'll include them somehow in the supplemental. And then finally, one, once that was in place, not very well, of course, the interagency didn't really show up in, in large numbers, but when that was in place, then it was sort of, okay, now what do we do? What do we do with this money? What do we do with the $18.6 billion? 
How do we spend it? What's the most effective policy for stabilizing the place? One thing that I would point out, and it's something that I think as a nation we all need to focus on, the agencies who were sort of wrangling over this, and this is primarily DOD, state, and AID, all of them thought they knew what to do. I think all of them thought they had the answer. DOD said, look, we don't trust AID, they didn't really do a very good job in uh, Afghanistan, let's control this money, we'll figure it out. The answer is billion dollar mega, uh, mega uh, uh, in infrastructure projects. That's how you really do this. That's how you stabilize. So you give a billion dollars to Bechtel or KBR and you have them build a power plant or some water treatment plant. Um, it's all about infrastructure. State and AID had a different view. They said, no, 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 you've, you've, uh, you've done you know, what DOD knows how to do and what it normally does, which is spend a lot of money uh, on huge mega contracts. Uh, what you really need to do is focus on governance and market liberalization, and that's really the answer. That's really how you get stabilization. Uh, AID was sort of the same way. They said, no, you look, it's really all about institution building. It's about capacity building. You've got to divert some of that money. Uh, and I was involved in some of this when I was at CPA when Ambassador Negroponte uh, came on. We convinced him, look, you, you can't spend all of this money on these mega infrastructure pro projects. You really need to focus more on capacity building and, and, and move it into, into you know, more... Um, uh, more of the, of the longer-term goals that you're, you're trying to uh, accomplish. And that happened. Some, some, some money was actually moved at that time. But the bottom line is none of these things actually produced stability. None of those answers that each of the agencies thought they had produced stability. The mega projects didn't do it. Certainly focusing on democracy didn't do it. Market liberalization did not do it. I spent a lot of time writing the foreign investment law for Iraq, one of the dumber things I did when I was there, and it was quickly reversed by the Iraqi government uh, uh, just uh, within the last year. Um, but that's what we did. That's what we thought was the thing that needed to get done. But you know what? That didn't produce stability either. Um, and on the bottom there, I just have some examples of some of the things, some of the early policies we had that turned out to be not quite what we thought, that turned out to either bite us uh, later on or turned out to be counterproductive. Uh, reconciliation is always my favorite one. That's kind of a vintage um, development nation building term. Reconciliation normally means bringing up the downtrodden groups and making the former oppressors pay for their sins and or genocide or whatever it was that they did. And it's uh, tried and true in, in nation building theology. Uh, but the irony in Iraq, of course, is we, we, we applied the tried and true formula. We said, okay, let's reconcile. Uh, let's, let's, let's support the Shiites and the Kurds, who really had nowhere to go up. And, and what we eff effectively ended up doing was disenfranchising the Sunnis. We debothified uh, or desunified, as some people call it, and e e e effectively you ended up disenfranchising the Sunnis. Ironically, of course, three years later, now the term reconciliation has a totally different meaning. What we thought needed to be reconciled, we realized we created a monster. Now, when Khalilzad came on board and General Casey was there, they said, this doesn't look too good. We, we, we went, went too far. What we really need to do now is, is bring the Sunnis back into the political fold. So reconciliation now means bringing the former oppressors, who in the last couple of years kind of became the downtrodden groups, back into the fold, back into the political fold. Uh, the elections and the Constitution, they were all hailed as great successes at the time. Uh, if you look at them very closely, though, how successful were they? Some people would argue that they actually increased the divisions, that they further alienated the Sunnis. The Constitution is a difficult issue if you're not a constitutional scholar, but the Constitution, as written, many people consider a disaster, myself included. Uh, the form of federalism that, that uh, got made its way into the Constitution effectively disenfranchises the Sunnis permanently. It permanently locks them out of the oil revenue for the future. So the Constitution was a disaster waiting to happen, as far as I'm concerned. And lots of folks on the ground knew that. Lots of folks recognized that issue, but it went forward anyway. Remember, Khalilzad had to actually include a provision before he could get some small group of Sunnis on board to, 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 to pass it that basically said, you know, we're only passing this with the agreement that we will revisit this issue and we'll do an amendment to it. But the federalism uh, uh, principle, the federalism provision in the Constitution is, is an absolute disaster. Uh, 
And of course, the amendment process has not happened yet. That's one of those political milestones that simply has not happened. DDR, uh, demobilization, disarmament, and uh, rehabilitation. Again, another tried and true nation building principle. Everybody talks about DDR. You got to do DDR. Well, do you have to do DDR? We did it. And look what we got. We debathified. We demobilized the army. And you ended up with a security problem unlike any we've seen in a long, long time. State-owned enterprises. Uh, that's an issue that continues to rage, you know. If, it's, if you're talking about typical long-term development, and you're a development economist, what do you want to do? You want to get rid of them. You want to privatize. You want to make the economy more efficient. And that's all quite true. That's all quite understandable and, and practical. But in an insecure environment, does it really make sense to try to privatize or at least not open or rehabilitate the state enterprises as they are? Do we really care if there's 100 people on the factory floor mopping the floor? Wouldn't it be better to get them off the street? So getting back to the issue of post-war stabilization policy, uh, one of the points I wanted to make is we didn't really start to uh, address the issue of, of um, the importance of the human element, which is something that Elizabeth talked about this morning, which I, I thought, by the way, was a, was a great presentation. That kind of went over our heads until we started to recognize that there was an insurgency, and people started talking about counterinsurgency. And then that whole human element sort of came in. Um, so what I want to talk about a little bit now is, okay, well, how, how would you make this work? How, what, you know, what kind of a policy would you have? And I, I don't know that I have any great answers. I'm going to offer you a theory, which is going to be a little bit controversy, controversial. But I want to start the discussion. I think there needs to be a national debate on this. The first place I would start is, is I, we need to distinguish between those operations where the U.S. is a belligerent as opposed to a third-party intervener. So don't look at Bosnia or Kosovo, where we're, we're involved in peacekeeping or, or peace operations or peace enforcement. Look at Iraq, look at Vietnam, where the U.S. is actually a belligerent. It's a totally different thing. Our sons and daughters are coming home in body bags. Everything we do uh, is different. And, and the notion of stabilization is different. It's different from nation building. It's different from development. The, st the, the stabilization element is a huge issue. Um, you, we need to focus on pacification, a term that kind of fell out of fashion in Vietnam, uh, but I'm trying to get across this issue of, of, of it being population focused. And the governance and infrastructure, job creation, rule of law, all of these things look a little bit different when you're talking about stability. And these are just uh, some photos I'm going to go through quickly. These are power generators as opposed to a huge power generation plant. And the idea there is that um, if, if your interest is, interest is in long-term development, you might give Bechtel a billion-dollar contract to uh, build a power plant, which may not be ready for four years. But if your interest is in, is in stability, you may spend that money differently. You may spend that money. Maybe you're going to spend it on, on a bunch of diesel-operated generators, thousands of them, to bring power immediately. Uh, many of you know the, the uh, phases of the joint operation. We've gone from the uh, four-phase approach to the six-phase approach. But the significance of that is the new phase four, which is devoted to um, stabilization activities, stabilizing activities, and phase five is enabling civil authority. Uh, I think one way to uh, address this issue is we need to kind of adopt the, the, the um, doctrine that the military has given for this new phase four, phase five, and make it government-wide. There needs to be government-wide doctrine on stability operations. Um, the fa phase four, as I was saying, is population focused. Phase three, of course, is the military phase. That's the, that's the dominating phase. That maybe is kind of the high tech thing that Elizabeth, that, you know, that, you, that needs to be high tech. Phase four is population focused. Phase five, when you finally get to phase five, maybe that's where you start developing more on institutions and the traditional nation building and whatnot. But phase four has to be sui generis. It has to be looked at individually on its own. Iraq is still in phase four, I would argue. And I would further say, the way you do it is the military retains the lead in four, just stays in the lead in four. Uh, somewhat modeled, I would say, I think Cords is a good model there. I think that may be the only time in the post-war history where we had an integrated civil military command. Um, Bob Comer and Colby actually reported to General, General West, Westmoreland. Uh, but that's the model that I would use. The big question, of course, is the transition. How do you know? when you go from four to five. Well, what the military now says is you enter into five when there's a viable host government when there's a, 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 on the ground. 
Uh, I don't think that that works. You have that in Afghanistan. You, you, you know, you have, what's the viable government? We've gone through about three governments in Iraq already. I think I would make it much more simple. I think you simply follow the level of the military effort. You have 150,000 troops in Iraq. If you have that many troops, you know there's a security problem. So you know you're in phase four. When you see a major redeployment, when that number gets cut in half or in one quarter or they all move into the desert or something, then maybe you have a change. But right now, it's real simple. You've got a security problem, so you're still in phase four. Um, I'm going to end, I'll skip this, on uh, the role of the interagency and what you might do when you bring the agencies in. One thing you have to keep in mind is we have to first focus on their capabilities. If you bring them in now the way that they are currently trained, agencies will do what they know. And what they know is mostly regulatory. They know how to bring things into compliance with international institutions and standards. And they know how to mimic US institutions. They're good at that. Uh, but they're not so good at stabilization. Some of this population-focused, cultural-focused uh, cultural in intelligence and, and type of activities that need to be done in the stabilization phase, they don't really have a good background in that. So the first thing you need to do is to sort of train them on what needs to get done in the stabilization phase. If you bring in transportation now, what you're going to get is a bunch of safety regulations. You know, if you bring in commerce, labor, the same thing. They know how to put an unemployment insurance program in place, but they don't know how to create jobs. It's just not what they do for a living. Not because they're stupid and because they're bureaucratic. It's just not what they do, and it's not what they know. So you need to kind of go back to the beginning and, and figure out how you would, you would produce the capabilities. Then focus on the, um, uh, the capacity. Uh, you then, then you can focus on the training, on the resources. And one thing, one thing I would say that is key to making it work is to hold them accountable. We have a NSPD 44, which is a, you know, a, a um, White House directive to the State Department, ordering the State Department to sort of coordinate all the agencies. That's all well and good, <clears throat> but it does not give them any authority over the agencies. Until there is an executive order, or some White House direction to each agency. You know, you justice will do this, you commerce will do that, you labor will do that. Um, and that can be done either by a White House directive or by Congress stepping in and creating some kind of a Goldwater Nichols II, basically outlining the um, responsibilities of each agency. But until they're accountable, and until, you know, a, the Secretary of Transportation is called before a congressional committee and says, and is asked, well, you know, why isn't the port in Uncasa dredged? Until that happens, uh, you're not going to find them stepping up to the plate the way we would like them to. Okay, with that, I'm going to stop and uh, let the discussion begin. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bernie. Uh, and I note that uh, General Dunlap has em emerged from the cybersphere and has shown up in our presence. That's a, a new technological uh, invention of uh, cyber movement, no doubt. Uh, our next discussant, did I, uh, what did I agree to here today? I think I have Nadia next. Yes, thank okay. you. Dr. Shadlow. Thanks. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here this morning and to offer some comments on Bernie's paper. Um, he covered clearly a, a range of issues from appropriate use of force to phases of operations to command and control issues. And I'll end up focusing on the latter. I actually uh, disagree a little bit with Frank's comment early on, although there's always uh, some concern disagreeing with the moderator, that I think these actually are issues integral to civil military relations, these command and control issues, because it's where the strategic issues that we talk about are actually hashed out on the ground. Um, as I said, the paper did a good job, I think, of describing civil military tensions over the appropriate use of force and of describing the failure of both military and civilian agencies to develop the capability to help the United States achieve its political objectives in interventions, whether they're predominantly military interventions or civilian ones. For reasons we probably can discuss all day, and I'm sure we will, the military has resisted developing a core capacity for these types of operations, and civilian agencies have been equally deficient, responding by contracting out. I think that a, it's a combination of history and expedience, and both have seriously depleted important tools that we have in our foreign policy arsenal. In fact, I'd argue that perhaps Bernie was maybe easier on the civilian side and easier on USAID than, than I would be. I think it's one of the least transparent agencies out there. Um, 
although I, I realize it's changing, and he talked about some of this, I think that it's uh, to follow USAID as a model today in terms of its contracting out model would be very, very problematic. Um, I'd wager that you can try to learn more about a military black program than an information about how much a USAID contractor actually gets in terms of its overhead charges. In fact, the latter figures are extremely difficult to come by, especially when you're dealing with subcontracting. So I'm not sure, I think that that model has to be rethought fundamentally. Stability and reconstruction operations cannot be separated out as primarily civil or military in nature. Both operations, um, these types of operations require both elements of power at the same time. Precisely because civil and military expertise needs to be integrated to achieve the strategic effects we want, I would argue that unity of effort is actually the wrong operating model right now, yet it's defining how the interagency is thinking about the problem. Unity of effort is a phrase which continues to drive interagency thinking, but without the concomitant attention to unity of command and the accountability that that brings with it, its adoption risks institutionalizing many of the problems we're seeing now in Iraq and Afghanistan. Unity of effort confuses a process with an operational plan. It is a PowerPoint answer to the problem of how to get different actors with different skill sets to work together on the ground. In a unity of effort scenario, you can't direct actors, diverse ones, to do certain things. You can't shift resources as needed quickly and efficiently to targeted areas. As a former State Department official pointed out to me, it takes the problematic model of the State Department coordinator or czar and applies it to a wartime situation. State Department coordinators symbolize attention to an issue, but they have little real budgetary authority, real authority, or, or accountability down the line. The model which is working on the ground and hasn't yet been discussed today but, but probably will be is the SERP, the Commander's Emergency Response Program Funds. These are funds controlled by the military and used to complete small reconstruction projects deemed to be significant. There's no overhead and effects are as close to immediate as possible in a theater. And it's interesting if you look at some reports on the PRTs, there was an interesting study done in 2006 and it directly compared the outcome um, in, in the same set of schools built by SERP commander funds and schools built by USAID contractor funds and there's a huge difference and it, it's documented. The SERP provides a model for how a unified commander can direct the use of funds for various reconstruction projects. In the case of Afghanistan, General Barno was well known for using these funds efficiently and strategically, coordinating all the different assets at his command, but he was, he was accountable and in control of the use of the funds. This is a type of model which needs to be duplicated more broadly. It works. Under it, a commander has the authority to direct funds and programs that he deems necessary in accordance with an overarching strategic plan. And as I noted before, he's accountable. For the most part, this commander will need to be military in stability and reconstruction operations. Why? And I know this will be debated. For two reasons. First, because most stability operations involve activities in contested areas. That is, not everyone will be happy about the presence of U.S. troops in the region, and U.S. personnel will need to worry about two things at once, security and reconstruction. Second, such operations are inherently a part of war. As much as it creates discomfort among American civilian leaders, the military has always been involved in shaping the political end state of war. Thus, I respectfully disagree with, with General Dunlap in that it's not um, a fashion. This has historically been a part of war. We're now calling them stability operations, but in the past it was called military government. Um, in the past, it was what civil affairs reservists dealt with over time. So the, the term may be new, but the phenomenon of the military needing to manage the end state of, a, of an intervention in a political way has always been a part of American history. Of course, there'll be contingencies where the environment is permissive, where U.S. personnel can enter a country and rebuild without security concerns. A good litmus test, I think, is whether security can be provided by local indigenous forces. If so, I would argue that these are cases of strategic foreign assistance, of longer term nation building, or of developing partnership capacity, which is a new term we're talking about now. And this goes to some of the points that Bernie just made before about appropriately categorizing these operations. But these are not cases of stability and reconstruction, which by their nature presume instability and the need to reconstruct things which have been broken. <laughs> 
Um, some of the same skill sets will be required and some of the same modules of experts will be needed, but command relationships will differ due to the complexity of managing violence and reconstruction. There is ongoing resistance to deciding who is in charge of, the, uh, of these types of operations, and I think that this is probably uh, hugely responsible for the problems that we're seeing now. Um, I think Bernie's point about the 2005 NSPD um, 44, which announced that the State Department would be in control and in the lead, um, I, th I thought his comments were apt, and I think it's even interesting to note that two years later, despite this directive in 2005, General Lute was just appointed to do something which sounds on paper very, very similar to what that original directive pointed out. Uh, the military in the lead does not mean ignoring uh, the civilian contributions at all. It does not mean ignoring um, experts in any of the other agencies. But precisely because various experts are needed, and precisely because you have to bring them together in a, in a certain way on the ground to achieve national or strategic effects, you need to have someone in charge of the mission for a period of time who has accountability. I think also to sum up this actually um, d although on the surface it may seem to disagree with the previous panel, I think it's actually a way to get where Liz was talking about, the human element, because I think that the only way you will change the military organization over time will be by creating structures and incentives, including accountability, um, which bring these missions back into the active military. I know this is the Reserve Officers Association, but I think that historically all of these tasks have been pushed out into the reserves there's a rationale for it in some cases, but I think it has allowed the military to basically say, we do these things, but not really. Um, and um, so that's, that's all. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Shadlow. And now, uh, Heather, can you uh, conclude our panel? Sure. I, I have the privilege of being flanked by two very incredibly strategic thinkers, but I think I'm going to change tack a little bit and take us down into the weeds on some of the questions that they raised. Uh, as they surveyed the waterfront on this. I think Bernie raised for us two, two interagency problems instead of just one. The first is how to draw on a variety of assets and expertise so that we can provide a capability in the field. And then the second is how to manage that capability back in the foreign policy community in DC. And I'm coming at this dual question with a bit of a dual or schizophrenic perspective. One from the three-year deployment in Iraq, both as a soldier and a civilian, and also from my former life at OMB, where we were setting up an interagency process to manage terrorism back before terrorism was fashionable. And I have to say that neither of those experiences gives me much confidence that we are on the right track yet in either of these respects, uh, the field capability or the interagency uh, overarching management. So let's start with the field capability. Uh, I'm going to put this more bluntly than Bernie did, and that is that we do not have a capability to do this mission, either in the U.S. government or in the international community. And we need to face that front on if we're, we're going to be able to uh, tackle the issue. We don't have a knowledge base uh, to develop effective strategies and policies, and even if we did, we wouldn't have the right skill sets and people in the field to implement them. We have a lot of the pieces, we have a lot of beginnings, but we haven't put it all together in a way that uh, adds up to a coherent and comprehensive whole. And for the reasons Bernie laid out, we've been compensating by relying on the military to fill that gap. And the elephant in the room for all these discussions, for all these conferences, is whether the military should prepare itself to do better and to do more of this. And DOD 3000.05 has partly made that decision already. It, there is, as you said, a lot of talk about uh, partnerships and reaching out to the rest of the community. But there's also a line in there, a very troublesome line, that says, the military will prepare to do all of this on its own in case the civilians don't show up. And a lot of people think that the civilians will never show to the extent they need to, so the only answer is to improve the military's capability to take this on. So either way, there's a basic faith that the military can at least be a stopgap measure, or in Bernie's description of the phased approach, actually take the lead role at least for a certain uh, period of time until it transitions over to another authority. I'm going to push back on that because I think that it is a, a very dangerous solution to the capability problem. And I'm judging, uh, making that judgment based on the, the, what I saw in Iraq. And maybe I can share a story that, uh, that gives you a sense of, of where that fear comes from. 
I was assigned to the CPA office responsible for uh, standing up the local councils and civil society in Baghdad. And at one point, we met with the Army colonel who was in charge of Sadr City. He was trying to struggle, struggling, really, to stand up the Sadr City District Council and to build its authority. And he'd finally come up with the idea of a street cleanup program. It wasn't rocket science, but it was a basic, uh, uh, basic answer to providing some uh, essential services and, and um, getting people out to, to participate in the, in the rebuilding. So he would pay $10 a day to anybody who came out to clean up the streets. And the project had been running actually pretty smoothly for a while, and he went out to talk to the locals and find out what they thought of it. And they said, this is a great program. We love this program. We've got money in our pockets. The streets are cleaner. It shows concern for our communities. We just love this program, and we're so grateful to Muqtada Sadr for it. <laughs> and the colonel was, did a double take and said, no, no, this is the army program and the district council. And they said, no, it's Muqtada Sadr's program. He said, why, why do you think that? And they said, because Muqtada Sadr told us it was his program. Sadr agents had been going out, infiltrating the whole system, telling people that it was Sadr's idea and Sadr's money. And since they hadn't heard anything else from anyone else, they believed it. And the colonel is clearly crushed. All the, the credit for his bright idea is going to the Army's arch nemesis. And I asked him at that point, sir, why don't when you hand out the $10, you also hand out a certificate that says something like, thank you for participating in Iraq's program to rebuild you know, society. It's a small step, but important, blah, blah, blah. Signed, your friendly neighborhood local council. Your local neighborhood council meets every Wednesday at 3. Citizens are encouraged to come and give feedback on this program and other community priorities. And the colonel looked at me and he said, well, that's a good idea, but we don't have the capability to print certificates. And I thought, well, not only do we have CPA's Strategic Communications Division and an entire division of the Army devoted to nothing but printing certificates and, and brochures and things like that, but you could send any of your staff into a local <coughs> print shop in Sauter City and get 10,000 certificates printed up with the added bonus that it's good for local business. So the problem was that the colonel was probably stretched to the limit already, just running Sauter City, and had only enough resources to come up with this basic idea not to think about it in all the way through, not to integrate it with the wider goals of the, the mission, and not able to identify and access resources that were outside his immediate sphere of influence. And most importantly, he wasn't able to put it in the context of the Iraqis he was trying to help. And this is not a one-off. This, the problems the, colonels, the colonel was facing were pretty much standard for the military's involvement in d development and governance programs. Now, Nadia and Bernie had bo both mentioned SERP and give it a lot of credit, it, and, which it deserves for um, being very flexible and having an immediate impact. And there were a lot of innovative, thoughtful people out there figuring out how to use those resources effectively. But there were three major systemic pro problems with SERP uh, that, that aren't referred to very often when we, when we talk about it as a success story. The first is sustainable development. The military doesn't have any expertise in sustainable development, however they tell you differently. The commanders were looking at the immediate needs of the people that they were working with and what they could do for them right away. For instance, they'd look at a community that needed health care and would decide to build a clinic but you didn't program the uh, operational expenses for the clinic, you didn't have any way to hire doctors, so you end up with a shiny new clinic and no medicines on the shelves and no doctors to operate it. So the, the commanders were in such a hurry to help that they didn't do or couldn't do the analysis that would have told them that maybe in that case what was needed wasn't another clinic, but access, reliable access to the hospital in the next town, or vice versa, how, in whatever context uh, you had to look at. So the projects that we were doing weren't always helping solve the, the underlying problems. Second problem is that in the military has very little experience, or the people in the field who are running SERP has very, have very little experience in budgeting and contracting. So you'd make a contract with an Iraqi company to say refurbish a school, and a year later the desks are falling apart and the computers don't work. The Iraqi people in that community know how much the contractors were paid, and they know what they got out of it at the end. And their response is, either the Americans are corrupt and taking kickbacks from these contractors, or they're fools to pay so much for so little. And that kind of experience tended to alienate communities from the Americans who were trying to help them and the coalition forces, as opposed to winning hearts and minds. And then finally, 
there was a lack of integration with other projects to create a sense of building momentum. All these projects were ad hoc, unconnected to each other and to a process for decision making. So Iraqis simply saw a few improvements here and there and that only fed the mentality of what have you done for us lately as opposed to encouraging and, and empowering them to take uh, ownership of, of community development activities. And some of the folks in the room are asking, well, what about civil affairs? The, that's the expertise that, that civil affairs is supposed to offer. The, this idea that you bring in reservists who have uh, relevant civilian jobs and they can apply those skills from their civilian jobs to the mission. I think we overestimate how much, and I'll, I know their faces in the audience will push back on this in Q&A, but we overestimate the capability that civil affairs is providing us. There's a fallacy that you can take a beat cop, send him to Iraq, and have him be a police administrator or set up the entire police system. You, there's a fallacy even that he's going to be a good trainer of other beat cops. Training cops is a very technical, professional uh, niche, and you need to be very good at it if you're going to do it well. And even if you've got a police academy trainer in that reserve unit and asked him to train Iraqi cops, it's a fallacy that he's going to be able to do that in a totally different context with all the baggage of being an occupier and, and, and invaded force and without the language and cultural skills. It's a fallacy that he's even going to be able to train police the way he trains them back in in the US if he doesn't have additional preparation and skills. So I would suggest on the civil affairs front that it's there's a fundamental flaw there that you cannot bring skills into the civil affairs at the level and quality that you need them. And you can't nurture and refine and sustain them once you've got them there. So although the military is going to have an, an important and, and def well-defined role in these operations, it's not going to be the lead role, and it's not going to be about governance and development and economic assistance and state building. Any move like the 3005 directive that came out that leads in that direction starts to worry me because it seems to ignore the reality that DOD and the military in particular don't have it, the organizational culture, the, um, the, the institutional relationships that they need to, to be in charge of this or even to play a major role. Uh, the partnerships with non-governmentals, with international organizations, with the private sector that are so essential to this mission, that's not something DOD can, can be the lead in. There's even a question of the, the organizational culture being perhaps antithetical to an environment that needs to embrace ambiguity, needs to embrace a de debate, and include a significant questioning of authority. There are reasons we haven't set up the military to, to specialize in those, in those factors. And there's also the question of whether you're sending the wrong message from the very beginning when you send out the military to rebuild civic institutions. What message are you sending to a c country that's c just come out of a military dictatorship, the only institution that can create these civic, civic uh, authorities is the military? It's almost like you've, you've failed even before you've started. The problem is the reality is just as bad on the civilian side. Even if the civilians do show up, we don't have any of those capabilities or organizational culture in, on the civilian side either. Bernie talked about the State Department being uh, about policy development rather than policy, implementa policy implementation. But I'd go even further than that to ask where in State Department's mission is mass mobilization of the populace to participate in a democratic process or major economic overhaul of, the, of infrastructure or total rehabilitation, reconstruction of ministries from the ground up to make them more functional and accountable. That's just not in the, the State Department mandate. And USAID, I think Bernie's paper points out that uh, USAID is looking at long-term development, not, not the short term. And I remember a meeting with Andrew Natsios, the former director, who said, development is like a tree. You can spray the tree and prune the tree and water the tree, but the tree is going to develop in its own way over 20 to 50 years which is very true, but in Iraq, in six months, someone comes along and chainsaws down your tree. So if you haven't built the buy-in for that long-term development project within the first six months or the first six weeks, more likely, you're not going to be able to put the longer-term uh, program in place. So th the bottom line is that the military isn't the reason. The military's lack of capability and expertise in, in this 
mission isn't the reason it went wrong. It went wrong because nobody has the uh, capability or expertise to do this. But that's not going to be fixed by pushing the military into a role it's not cut out to play. And that, that brings us back to the, the second issue. What do you do? How do you build that expertise and create the right institutional structure for it if none of the agencies has the knowledge base or the organizational culture to do this mission? So now we're back at the Beltway, um, Beltway perspective. What, how does the interagency handle this challenge? We've all agreed, you know, there doesn't seem to be an existing agency that, that can take it all on, and you can't duplicate all the capabilities that each of those agencies offers, break them off and put them in a new agency. So the name of the game is interagency cooperation, interagency coordination. But that approach also has some fundamental flaws. And here I'm going to echo Nadia's uh, discussion of the unity of effort. Interagency coordination is great when it serves an advisory in or inform informative purpose, but it tends to be, it breaks down when you ask it to play a directive role and when you ask it to mess with agency budgets and operations. An agency's core mission is always going to take priority over what some interagency body is recommending that it do. And by the time you invest enough clout in an interagency body to win in a competition with agencies, you've made a new agency, which is what we said probably can't be done for this mission. I worked on the interagency process for terrorism, combating terrorism, and we had set up a very robust interagency process that we were very proud of, built from working groups, interagency inter working groups that would build these programs into the agency budget. We'd have the White House and NSC and OMB reviewing them to confirm that the priorities were included. You'd uh, highlight those priorities c to Congress and monitor the execution, and that process failed at every single step because the deck is stacked against it. Interagency will always lose to a, a system that's created for agency decision making. So the key is to find a way to draw on those core competencies of all the agencies that have something to offer for this mission without radical reform that degrades existing missions and without having to duplicate all those capabilities in a separate agency. So what's the solution there? Well, there's some visions, but a vision without a budget is a hallucination. So I'm going to spare you the pipe dreams and just leave you with a couple principles that we should consider in terms of how to manage this interagency problem. And the first is that you have to have a lead agency. You have to have the unity of command advocate. You have to have someone in charge who's the keeper of the institutional memory and who seeks out and refines the knowledge from this knowledge base that we don't really have it yet. And that lead agency also has to play the role of the advocate in the decision-making process, who can speak from a position of credibility and say, no, that's not going to work. Let me tell you why, but here's an option that will. I've done this. I know this. I'll, I'll, I'll prove it to you. It's also possible that you could look at doing this on a reimbursable basis, that you have the lead agency making the whole plan, making the, coming up with the, how it's all going to fit together, but it goes out to the other agencies and pays them to participate in the place that, that uh, is most relevant. And that gives them the chance to compete different groups against each other. So that you could look to DOD to provide a capability, but you could also look to the contractors or the private sector uh, to do the same thing. And then finally, the final note is that the capability that we need to create for this mission is more than just the right number of people with the right skills. It's about doctrine, training, equipment, materials, organizational culture, institutional relationships. It's the whole gamut to build and transfer and use knowledge. And to get that right, you have to dedicate an organization, staff, train, equip, and resource it to do it. And until you have all those pieces working together, you're not going to see anything but marginal improvements or more likely continued failures. On that optimistic note, thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, now we're now going to turn to uh, questions and uh, hopefully some some insight answers. Uh, as long as we uh, have people at the uh, at the ready, we're not going to eat until a specified time. If you forget, fail to ask questions, I'm going to ask questions. We're not going to eat until 11:55 because <laughs> I'm on the clock. So you might as well ask questions, and we'll begin with Dr. Stevenson, sir. Charlie Stevenson, size. I was struck in this panel and in the previous one by really an order of magnitude question. 
it, it reminds me of an exchange I had with my dad when I was a small boy, and I asked him, how do they make horseradish? And he said, well, you take one horse and one radish. <laughs> and nobody has talked about the extreme imbalance between the Defense Department, the State Department, and of course the rest of the federal government. Uh, there was a golden year, 1950, when the State Department budget was one half of the Defense Department budget. But now we've reached the stage, was it 20 to, to one differential? And the, in the numbers of people, there are more people in military bands than in uh, the whole foreign service. There, there's a real uh, disparity of capability, disparity of dollars and so my question is how can you get into this system given the problems with contracting out private contractors and that how can you get just enough people with the right skill sets to do any of these kinds of jobs that, that you're suggesting how can you get them in and have them accountable and how can you deal with professionalism when most professions don't believe in lateral entry and yet what this talks about this probably requires a lot of lateral entry. Mm -hmm. Does anybody want to go first? With yeah, let, uh, let me start. Uh, I, I think you raise an excellent point, and, and I was referring to that a little bit in the power imbalance and how it has even shifted more in the last 10 years. I think that that's true. Um, th the one thing I would point out, though, is, and it's a concern that I have, is I think th the argument implies that if only state or AID and the other agencies had the resources uh, that everything would be fine and that we would know how to stabilize. I don't think that that's true. Uh, as Heather so well, you know, so capably said, it's no one's core mission. It's just, it's not the core mission of the Army, the Marines, DOD, state AID. No, it's just no one's core mission. So no one knows how to do this. Uh, so I think that that's the first thing. But having said that, I think the way you make it happen is you just you make it their core mission. Just make it their core mission, and either Congress makes it or the White House makes it. That's what happened in courts. President Johnson just sat down and said, this is not acceptable. You know, I'm going to make it your mission. And he put his buddy, you know, Bob Comer, in charge and made it his mission. So I think there are ways to do You know, where there's a will, there's a way. And sure, there's more resources that are needed. Maybe Congress passes more resources. Or as Heather said, you could do sort of a, um, a national response plan, you know, the, the domestic response um, uh, mechanism whereby FEMA reimburses the other agencies when they respond to domestic disasters. So I think that's th those are two possible ways of doing it. I would just, um, on the contracting out issue, I think the danger of, of what's happening today is that you're going to create a large entity on the outside lobbying organizations that will have it in their interest to continue to contract out what I think many of the missions are core missions, actually. And so I think that will make it even harder to build the kind of internal government civilian capacity that Charlie alluded to and that we've been talking about. You're going to create a large entity on the outside with a lot of um, power on Capitol Hill that will continue to sort of perpetuate the model and actually grow it. Back in the, Bos in the Balkans days, a lot of the time the military would argue that forcing the military to do this kind of mission would ultimately break it. It would reduce its combat effectiveness for other things. And I think that argument applies just as well to state and USAID. You can break them pretty easily by forcing them to do something that's outside their core competency and for which they have no, no, uh, none of the background that they would need. State Department serves an, an, an important role in our foreign policy community, as does USAID, there's a reason that it looks at 20 to 50 year high time frame. That do, that's what it takes for social and economic development to happen. So if you force those agencies to change, I'm afraid that not only will we get something that's not right, but you're also going to sacrifice what they were doing right before. And that to me says if it's that hard to break an agency to make it do something different, why not just start from scratch and build it the way that you want to build it? Okay. Sir? Sure. Heather, I'm going to uh, kind of respond. That was the face I was pointing at. <laughs> to your comments about civil affairs. Um, I, I think, and I'm, and I'm going to be kind of direct about this, I think you're falling a little bit into the trap of judging a church by its followers. I agree completely with your assessment of civil affairs. I'm not sure what your point is, though. Do we abolish civil affairs because it isn't doing well? Um, 
I would point out that that um, I, I I absolutely agree. Uh, we've oversold the product. That is, the civil affairs community has oversold the product in the last 15 years with respect to its ability to engage culture, language capabilities, nation building, functional specialists, all those different things. But civil affairs with respect to, and, and we don't really have a, a, a real strategic context of what civil affairs is, although some of the papers I've written have tried to, to do that. Um, we really don't understand what civil affairs is. We don't really understand its potential. But what civil affairs really is about is about introducing soft power other than the high-tech capabilities, the human element that are largely resident in the interagency and the private sector. The key to this whole business in civil affairs is understanding that civil-military relationship, what the respective roles are. Civil, the, the civil side is actually the change agent. And those can also not just be from some sort of outside intervening power, NGO, interagency, UN, whatever. It can be actually found within the resident country. The military is the enabler. Every commander that I've gone to, I've said, good, good news and, and not so good news here, sir. The good news is, hey, guess what? We don't do nation building. So I agree with you there, but we enable it. And the paradox of it is you've got to engage in the process in order to get it. Sometimes you've got to get the military in there to kickstart the process by having uniform guys helping rebuild power pants and so on, but then turn it over and affect that to military to civilian transition process, which is, again, a key line of operation of civil affairs, Heather, both Heather, strategically like and operationally. Sure. I absolutely agree. I, I joined the military to do civil affairs. I believe in the mission. And I absolutely agree that it, it will continue to be an essential element of the, the larger state building, nation building, whatever you want to call it, stability ops. I just don't think you can do civil affairs in the military. And that's hard to swallow for a lot of us. But Who I think then? that it was interesting that uh, OTI did a review, Office of Transition Initiatives, one of the major players at USAID did a review of all their operations in Iraq. And they came up with a bunch of conclusions. And one of them was, we became more effective after we went around the civil affairs officers and went straight to talk to the maneuver commanders which was a shock to those civil affairs officers in the room because we had always thought of ourselves as being the translator between those civilian agencies and the maneuver commanders who could only think tank. You know, we, we could do that translation. It turned out that OTI and USAID wanted to go straight to the maneuver commanders because they had the trucks and they had the security and they had the guns and whatever else. Sure. The civil affairs folks didn't add value in that communication. You're right, the military is the enabler and the Civilian agencies need to reach that enabling uh, capability, but civil affairs is not giving them the access or the translation that they may have needed before. And I don't think you abolish civil affairs. I think you scale it down to do something within, it, it, it scale down the expectations so that it can actually add value at a certain level, and you look to other kinds of uh, of civilian agencies to provide some of the more sophisticated strategic aspects that we've been trying to play. Um, it's interesting that these human terrain teams, aside from Colonel Yanaway, have mostly been hiring cultural anthropologists from universities, from the private sector. Not They aren't getting that expertise in-house. And I, I know you've followed the civil affairs issue for a while. Have you had anything I to mean, add? I guess I, I, I I agree with um, many of Heather's points. I think it's important, and it's not. I think it's a very, very sensitive issue in, in the Army and in the Army Reserve. But civil affairs traditionally, as far as, as I understand it, has not been built up strategically by the Army in the same way that we're talking about now. So they're not saying, let's go out and find um, 20 uh, police captains around the country because we need to build up a capability to train police forces or indigenous security forces in, in external contingencies. That's not the way traditionally civil affairs has been built. It's been very local and community oriented so that slots open up in local units and they're filled by people with, with a, a certain skill set, but it's not the larger army saying, here are five key areas that we need to build and then going out and actively recruiting civil affairs reservists who happen to have that 
capacity in civilian life, even though I agree with Heather's point that even that capacity, that it's not an, a, an, a match necessarily. But I think that strategic element of civil affairs has, um, has hurt the Army's ability to develop a, a deep ability to, to do a lot of the operations that we're talking about here. Okay, thank you. I want to get into the cyber dimension. I'm going to have to manage the clock here a little bit tighter. Al. So concise questions, please, and we'll get you some concise answers, and we'll get through everybody. But Al. Uh, it might be just appropriate to remind the online audience that you can pose a question by typing a question in the computer bo in the box on your computer. But as of now, we can go to the oh, great. regular audience. The next gentleman over here, is that General Dunlap? Or? Oh, no. Thank you, and I'm sorry for arriving late. Uh, Charlie, just an, just a couple observations to answer the frequently asserted thing about there are more military bands and foreign service officers. If the foreign service officers were as effective ambassadors as the bands are around the world, then maybe there would be more foreign service officers. That would be the, the, the answer. And if the foreign service officers were willing to work what, for what the active duty band members get paid, that might be a factor too. Nadia, uh, to, to get back to your point, I do agree with you, and I should stand corrected, that the military in the past has done uh, occupations and has done military governments. But we found that it's not necessarily good for democracy. That's how we ended up with the Posse Comitatus Act and why we don't do that in this country. And uh, Heather, I completely agree with everything you said. I, I rarely ever do that at one of these conferences, <laughs> but, I, but I really do. And I think we ought to foot stomp the, the point that having the face of rebuilding a government or rebuilding an economic system to be somebody in uniform sends a message about this country. This country is not about military people setting up governments. It's not about military people setting up the free enterprise system. And so I think that that is an important capacity, which gets to my question. All of the discussion seems to presuppose that we're going to fight the last war again. And maybe there has been other discussion prior to my arrival. But as we look to the future, how much capacity, either in the military or in the civilian sector, should we build with the expectation that we are going to again occupy a hostile, sullen country of 24 million. Should we plan for 24 million? I was at another conference. They said, well, General Dunlap, we're, we might have to do something in Pakistan. Pakistan, that's 160 million people. What are we going to do? Build a 14 million person capability. So I'd be interested to hear your observations. Oh, uh, sure. Um, I, I think I think it's a great question and it's a tough issue that a lot of us grapple with, um, especially by my definition, since I'm not lumping the Iraq type operation in with other peace enforcement type operations such as Bosnia and Kosovo. I think they're totally different and I think we need to plan for them differently. Um, and I think if we, I, I think if we at least start there, I think that's the biggest, one of the biggest steps we can make. Now, and I agree with you, probably not too soon. Uh, I think this type of thing happens about once in a generation. I think the last time we faced it was Vietnam. And probably wh what I always say is if we don't fix this now, our children will make the same mistakes we're making now, just as our parents made those mistakes in, in, in Vietnam. So I, I think this is a, it is a relatively rare thing, but because it's a matter of life and death, um, and because it is a possibility, sure, there's Pakistan, there's Iran, there's Syria, there's North Korea, there, there's Cuba, there's, you know, there are places out there where you could envision this type of thing happening. A further thing I would argue, in looking into a crystal ball, which I don't really want to do, but in the post-Cold War world, it's easier. It's become easier, almost, for the U.S. to intervene. You don't have that counterbalance. So who knows? Maybe it won't be another generation. Uh, maybe it'll be less time than that. But, you know, look, the question is impossible to answer, but I, I, I don't think that means that we should not try to get it right and, and, and try not to develop doctrine to, uh, so that even if it is a future generation, doesn't produce the same mistakes that we have. Unlike Bernie, I do lump them in uh, with the other smaller contingency operations. And that's not, uh, he's right, they do require different kinds of planning, but they also require a lot of the same skill sets and the same kind of organizational relationships. So if I thought we had a choice, 
I would agree with you, sir, and I would run screaming from ever doing this again. But I feel that the, between the em epidemics and the failed states and the genocides and the, the whatever else it is, this is going to show up on our doorstep, and we can't afford to do it this badly. Again. I, I would just say that I think that it's hard to think of a war um, in which the political dimension of war didn't matter, in which the military wasn't involved in transitioning to uh, a different form of government or a stable government. And I don't, just don't think you can separate out that political dimension. I do think that the more effective the military is as in that transition phase, um, the less time it needs to be in the theater. So I, I agree, you don't want a military officer there as a, as a proconsul for a long period of time in a country. But there's a transition pa phase where these, um, these arrangements do matter precisely because it is our, in our interest to shift quickly to um, civilian or local indigenous authority, which is actually the ideal, that you would take the military completely out relatively quickly and put local leaders in, in quickly and leave. But unless you develop those capabilities on the ground and a way of thinking and a new culture and some core set of capabilities integral to the military, you won't get to that transition phase as quickly as we might like. Next question, sir. Thank you. <coughs> Ronald Newman, retired ambassador and now president of the American Academy of Diplomacy, having also been in Baghdad partly with Heather, uh, as well as the last two years as ambassador in Afghanistan. Uh, a few quick points. Uh, first of all, this kind of reconstruction is as much art as it is science. Um, I think all of us who've worked on it know that. And I draw from that the conclusion that those who are good at it and those who are abysmal at it can be found both in uniform and in the civilian suit. Uh, there is no culture, and you, I could go on at a great length and I promise not to, about things like police program where neither side has acquitted themselves with nearly enough glory to make a claim to run the outfit uh, and have demonstrated that there's a lot of interaction needed. Secondly, uh, it's been said several times, it needs to be said again that power goes with budgets. Um, I don't particularly think I should, much as I want to, deal with General Dunlop's comment on bans and foreign service officers. Um, having probably been shot at as much as anybody in this room. But the fact is that we're leaving out, this whole discussion has left out in my mind one major piece of responsibility, that is national command authority, ultimately the president's responsibility to fund a war. And right now only the uniform military is on a war footing in Iraq and Afghanistan. The State Department has not been enlarged to deal with a war. Uh, and I spent months trying to keep seven USDA personnel in the PRTs in Afghanistan. But you got to, unless you're going to give them more money, you deal with the fact that state organizations don't like to have their local agricultural specialist gapped for a year while you send him off someplace else. And nobody has given any of the other agencies the resources to step up to the tasks. So there's no point talking mandates unless you talk budgets and that ultimately must be a national command authority decision. And I, I really wish the people who would talk about agencies would talk about where the responsibility lies to fund and enable the agencies. 37, 39 and a half years in government, I have never seen a czar able to control a damn thing unless the czar controlled the money. It doesn't matter whether it's State Department, drug policy, or anything else. I think there is a danger we could do the last war over again as we create a civilian agency. But I think at the end of the day, it, well, part of this discussion has to be the difference between deciding strategic objectives and managing on the ground. You can put anybody in charge, but you ought to put somebody in charge. Having a split and not rectifying that split is, to my mind, a problem of strategic direction but which can be resolved, sort of coped with in the field by teamwork, not resolved. But you can have it either way. But yeah, you ought to have in an early combat phase and early stability phases, there ought to be one, there ought to be one chief on the ground. I think we made it work, General Barno made it work with uh, Ambassador Khalilzad before Carl Eikenberry and I made it work. But it's, um, it's a coping mechanism. 
but so far we're doing we're going backwards you know we've now got a multiple chain of command in Afghanistan where we had a single um, so I just think we have to differentiate constantly between what is a strategic priority for the direction for which Washington has to do and what are implementation issues where we need to look at whether we're giving the authority and the responsibility sufficiently to the people on the ground. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Professor. Al, do we have anything? No. no. Sorry, sure. Roger. Okay, we're going to change the mode of operation. I'm going to ask, we're going to alternate very quickly. I'd like you to ask your question and then sit down. We'll ask the panelists to take notes on the cumulative questions and respond as a close-up. We have four minutes and five questions. You, sir. I'm another retired uh, Foreign Service officer, former ambassador. My first decade was in Vietnam, including service with cords. We've mentioned uh, cords several times. That was a successful model. It did work. Why did we not yeah. use that model in Iraq? Are we doomed to constantly relearn those lessons? Is there a realistic possibility for an organizational fix to that, for example, some sort of interagency Goldwater Nichols? Sure. Sir. Uh, my question is more of a comment. I'm a, a graduate student at Georgetown working on my PhD, and uh, I hear a lot about this um, all the time from the IR perspective. I come, from, I come at it from a comparative politics perspective, looking at the human dimension and thinking over and over again that you say we have no theory base, that's because we have no theory of state formation. The examples of when the United States, for instance, has done governance, when the military has done governance, including the Civil War, have all been in Western context. We don't know how to do it outside of that context. There is the beginning of that knowledge base. It's in academia. People are working on this. And it's simply my comment that a lot of what's going on is that the training of officers pushes them towards IR degrees and not towards degrees that look at the question of how do groups come to make decisions? That is, how do they decide on the mechanisms for making decisions which would lead to the development of institutions of governance, be they democratic or merely stable? Thank you. And without a national approach, you can't make national capacities. Sir? Hi. I uh, recently returned from Iraq in, in May working on uh, helping build the Diyala PRT and the Saladin PRT. So I've seen the, the absolute worst and somewhat shameful uh, uh, lack of interagency cooperation. Um, be that as it may, the folks on the ground just rolled up the sleeves and, and worked together, State Department, DOD. Got one minute left. Um, the, the, the question I have, though, is it's a mess. It's terrible. It's difficult. So what? Is there anything in your study history, your study of, 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 uh, of, of political science that would suggest that introducing democracy or these big ideas to a society is going to be anything but chaotic, murderous, and, and tumultuous? And to wrap up, this will have to be the final question. General Cushman, sir. I'm a Lieutenant General Jack Cushman, U.S. Army, retired. Retired in 1978, but I've been doing a lot of writing about military operations and that kind of thing since then. And I must say I was appalled at the way that we went about Iraq, especially the post-hostilities phase. I've written an article on this, a long 23-page paper, which any, if anybody wants it, they can just send me an email, Jack Cush Sr., J-A-C-K-C-U-S-H-S-R, AOL.com. I spent three tours in Vietnam, four years, two as a division advisor in the Delta, and one as a brigade commander in the 101st Airborne Division, and then again, senior advisor in the Delta at the military region level. I watched us learn how to do this right. We started out very poorly, but by the time 67 came around and Bob Comer got into place, we had it pretty well understood and we set up cords. What happened to all that know-how? Now, my paper tells you, if you read it, that when the Joint Chiefs of Staff found out that the President was about to go into, Vietnam, into Iraq, or that he was thinking about it, and that when he finally did, they should have taken on the post-hostilities phase. And General Franks should have considered that part of his mission. 
he let somebody else do it, and he, he should have insisted that the mission could not be accomplished of his command without a post-hostility phase. You learn that as a platoon leader. We do it right in Japan and Germany in World War II, and we just blew it. And it's a, it's a shameful performance by the U.S. military. The, chiefs, the Joint Chiefs of Staff and General Franks should be condemned for failing to do their job. Thank you. If uh, anybody has any closing comments, now's the time. Michael, can I run the 12? Could I beg your indulgence, Mr. Hoffman, because there's so few State Department representatives here. Okay, we have, we've had a few. But comment. Everyone needs to be attentive. We're running on a clock for very, very technology purposes Very short, because I purposes think here. it's important that there's no representative at SCRS on this panel. And since, you know, we are mandated to implement NSPD 44, and I won't make my comments because I'm very low in the food chain to be doing that, but I'm the only representative of SCRS here. And I would just ask the panel to address, you know, how they think, since our office is mandated to do interagency coordination, how that's going, how much they know of it, about it, how much they know about the Civilian Reserve Corps, and how they think you're, that's going or if that has any future. Because I don't hear much conversation about that, but we have a panel on interagency coordination. Thank you. It's a very valid question. I think that's wrap up okay. comments, please. Okay. Uh, just to wrap up to try to address the, the several comments that were made, I think overall we need a concept of war, and we, I mean the American public and civilian leadership in America that recognizes it's not just about battles. I think ironically, actually, the Army has done very well in this area, and it's moving in this direction. There have been a lot of excellent um, Army articles by people, Tony Echeverria, Con Crane, Lenny Wong, a, lo a lot of people have, are recognizing this, but I think actually it's an issue that civilians are not recognizing. I think it gets, if they did, some of the issues we're talking about might have been less problematic. If it's not just about the battle, then issues of funding, of reconstruction, of all the political elements that need to be drawn in would be thought about at the outset. And um, I think actually that's, that's the sort of key to where the civilians are in, in this. They need to understand that when asking about an intervention before going in, they need to think about the follow-on to that intervention. It's not just sort of a special forces unit going in, blowing something up and leaving. I would just say very quickly to tie in all those questions that I've seen the difference when we do it well. It really does have an effect when somebody has thought through this and gotten all the right expertise together and implemented it well. It The results are different and it seems to me that if you could pull all that that the good best pra the best best practices together then you can have a wider spread uh, widespread impact the problem is that lessons learned are never read mm -hmm. they must be taught and unless you have an institution that pulls all those best practices together and refines them and 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 then puts them into people's brains we aren't going to see much change in this and on the SCRS, the SCRS and the Consortium for Complex Operations and even some of the work USIP is doing is starting to address that, starting to create that institutional repository where you collect, refine, and then teach what you've learned. So maybe it's not as bleak as it, uh, it made up. Uh, I also did not want to give the State Department short shrift. Uh, most of us here, I think, are very aware of SCRS and what is going on. There are major constraints. NSPD 44, in my view, does not give the State Department enough authority. We've already talked about budgets and all of that stuff. Um, the Civilian Reserve Corps, all great idea. Major, major, major legislative piece that would be required. Uh, I'm heartened to hear several folks in the audience talk about cords. I really do think that's a model as painful as Vietnam is for us. Uh, I think we need to look back on the command and con control structure and the integrated civil military structure that we had there. Uh, the final comment I want to make is several folks have made the point about the dangers of a military lead in a post-conflict um, uh, society. I will tell you I'm less concerned about that and, uh, and uh, about that sending a bad signal. I'm much more concerned about the bad signal we send when we cannot provide security. I think that that's a lot worse uh, than uh, the military being there instead of a civilian commander. I brought you to lunch on time. Please join me in uh, congratulating our panel for their performance.